Coming up on this V12 production special, we're talking about train wrecks in 2023. First, a look at where the investigation stands in East Palestine, Ohio, and the video investigators have gathered showing the final moments before the catastrophic derailment. Then a dramatic police chase ends with a cop car in the wrong place at the wrong time. Plus, we'll look at the fake derailment that provides very realistic training for our first responders. And finally, is there a time when you'd want to intentionally derail a train car? All that and more is next on this V12 production special. Hello and welcome to this V12 production special. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking about train accidents and derailments from minor incidents to wrecks that will be remembered for many years to come. You know, it can be a difficult topic to discuss, but it's worth examining because railroads run through big cities, small towns, and even backyards all over the United States. First of all, we have to acknowledge that trains are an essential part of our economy and way of life. They haul all kinds of goods, including hazardous materials. It should be noted that, by and large, railroads do this safely and without incident, but unfortunately, when things go wrong, they can go wrong in a big way. We'll begin with an incident that got the attention of our nation and the world, the catastrophic derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Now, we're going to stick to the nuts and bolts of what happened here for two reasons. First, the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation is still ongoing. And second, because I'd like to focus on other incidents that have not received extensive media coverage. Okay, let's get started. On the night of February 3rd, 2023, Norfolk Southern Train 32N derailed 38 cars in East Palestine. 11 of those were tank cars hauling hazardous materials. They ultimately ignited and fueled fires that damaged 12 other rail cars that weren't derailed. No injuries were reported, according to the NTSB. Not long before the derailment, the crew got a critical audible alarm message from this wayside defect detector, also known as a hot box or hot bearing detector. This instructed them to slow and stop their train to inspect a hot axle. As they began to slow down, the train's emergency brakes activated. During the course of its investigation, the NTSB has gathered home and business surveillance footage tracking the train's movement up until the derailment. The footage was compiled and shown during an investigative hearing on June 22, 2023. Multiple video clips from cameras in Salem, Ohio, about 26 miles from the derailment site, show the glow of a fire under one of the rail cars. The NTSB also located this video of train 32N just before it went off the tracks. The investigators described what was seen in one of the clips from East Palestine as, quote, what appeared to be a wheel bearing in the final stage of overheat failure moments before the derailment. I'm including a link above and in the description of this video if you want to learn more about defect detectors and roller bearings. So where does the NTSB's investigation stand? Well, an NTSB spokesman told me that the fact gathering phase has been completed and their team is currently analyzing all the factual information. They'll then draft a report which board members will deliberate over. Ultimately, the probable cause of the derailment will be determined, and the NTSB could issue safety recommendations to prevent future accidents. Investigations like these typically take 12 to 18 months from the date of the accident. There is no doubt, this derailment has impacted countless lives, and we still don't know what, if any, long-term effects it'll have on the residents in and around East Palestine. Now, I'd like to discuss derailments and accidents that didn't get lots of media coverage, but are still worth examining. We'll try to understand why they happened and what you can do to stay safe around the tracks. The dramatic police dash cam video you're about to see looks like it's straight out of a movie or TV show, and believe it or not, the two cars hauled by the truck here might actually be headed to or from a film set. A quiet evening in Conyers, Georgia. It's April 11th, 2023, and a police officer is pulling up to help a trucker whose trailer has bottomed out on a railroad crossing. The driver is trying to find a way to get his truck off of here. I'm going to have to take these cars off, and then I hope the trailer raise up. The officer offers suggestions as both men try to come up with a plan. What if you just pull them forward and put the weight up on the 
on the axles up front. Soon, another officer arrives to help. And about a minute after that, bad news comes over the radio. 505 be advised, there is a train coming your way. The police dispatcher says they're contacting the railroad. We're contacting CSA. Seconds later, the gates are going down. Seventy one, clear out of there. Luckily, everyone is clear of the truck by the time this happens. Radio, we've got impact at by CSX. As the officer drives toward the wreck, you can see the truck's trailer has been split in half. One of the cars that was on it is sitting at the crossing and the other is gone. The dust is settling when more police arrive. Look closely at the side of the truck, NBC Universal. That's a clue about where those cars were going. Probably the set of a movie or TV show. This looks like a Chevy Nova from the early 1970s. It appears to be in one piece for the most part, but that wasn't the case for other things the train hit. There is significant damage to the railway equipment. And don't worry, the train crew was okay too. But the police wanted to check something else after that impact. All this time, a convoy of film production trucks is passing the scene, headed toward downtown Conyers. At this point, we get a closer look at the train. That red flashing light is an end of train device, or EOT. As the officer approaches the lead unit, CSX 6024, we can see where the other car went. This Mercedes is stuck to the front. I think this car is definitely totaled, but the locomotive fared a little better. Its front handrails are bent. And it appears its fuel cap is also missing. The cars behind the engines look like they're fine with no leaks. A few of them did have hazmat placards. The UN number here, 1301, means this car hauls vinyl acetate stabilized. But I don't know if it was loaded or not. Eventually, the officer walks back to the crossing and we get a second look at that trailer that was cut in half. Some trackside equipment was also taken out on impact. It was now time to get the road vehicles out of here. And one of the guys on the scene noticed something unusual about that Chevy Nova. The rails in front of the car for the camera. While the cleanup began at the crossing, the officer went to talk to the train crew about what happened. I know I asked y'all before, but y'all are okay in here. How, how did it, I mean, was there an impact for you in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How fast were y'all going? I'm just curious. I said 20, 40, 43, maybe. Back at the grade crossing, a heavy wrecker was hard at work removing the trailer. Of course, there was still a car stuck to the front of the engine, but with the help of the wrecker service, they came up with a plan. And then they're going to come try to strap this thing to the front of this engine and let y'all back down and just drag it back up there. Eventually, tow trucks came for that old Nova and the tractor. Then the train slowly emerged, dragging that Mercedes. Of course, locomotives are almost always going to come out on top when they go up against cars and trucks. There's no doubt, engines like 6024 are survivors. It's an EMD GP40-2 that was built in 1972. Now, with the train and wreckage out of the way, it's time for everyone to leave the scene. So what does the crossing look like a month later? Well, as you might imagine, all the debris appears to be gone. And it looks like CSX replaced some of the trackside equipment that was here, including putting in a new gate arm. The tracks cross the road here at Scott Street, right next to downtown Conyers. The line goes from Atlanta to Augusta and was once part of the Georgia Railroad. You'll see they have not forgotten about that railroad here in Conyers. I also found this sticker left over from the predecessor to CSX. This old depot is now the town's welcome center. Driving through here, I think you can understand why a production company might want to use it for a filming location. Sadly, that Chevy and the Mercedes never made it to their shoot. 
The train that evening was headed southeast on this line when it slammed into the trailer. They stopped a little more than a thousand feet from the crossing, according to the crash report filed by the Conyers police. The train, L84111, started its journey about seven miles away in Lithonia. CSX has a small yard here. This locomotive, CSX 6532, was actually the trailing engine the night of the accident. The train was headed to Covington, Georgia. Now, you may be left with a few lingering questions like, was anything hazardous spilled after the collision? Fortunately, according to the crash report, no hazmat was released. Another important thing to note on the crash report is that no citations were issued. Driving around this area, I never found any signs prohibiting trucks from going across this crossing. Hopefully, a situation like this never happens to any of us, but what if it does? Well, one thing you can do if there's no immediate danger is look for a blue and white sign like this one. These are called Emergency Notification System, or ENS signs. They have an 800 number you can call, along with the crossings number that you can give to the operator to tell them exactly where you are. Now, I'm not going to second guess what anyone did in this situation. I would imagine it was pretty tense. Ultimately, no one got hurt, and that's all that matters. The vehicles in this next video are far from classics. No, they were brand new. Auto racks are on the ground just east of Williams, Arizona, and some of their cargo has come spilling out. These are just some of the 20 cars pulled by a BNSF train that derailed on June 8, 2023. According to Coconino County Emergency Management, there were no injuries. That agency also shot the video and pictures you're seeing. And how about this shot? A brand new Ford F-150 upside down and pinned under an auto rack. According to accident data as reported by railroads on the FRA's website, the cause of this was H-503, buffing or slack action excessive train handling. A news story posted on azfamily.com referenced an FRA report that found the engineer did not use the brakes properly. However, while human error may be to blame, the FRA report referenced in the news story said the train that derailed was more than two times the size the engineer was qualified to operate. Next up, one of the wildest police chases I've seen recently. It actually involved a stolen police cruiser that ended up crashing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Norfolk Southern light engines are on the move in Peoplestown here in Atlanta, Georgia. The line here goes from Atlanta to Macon, Georgia, in his ex-Southern Railway territory. Once the locomotives pass, you can see car parts and black ballast near this crossing here at Hank Aaron Drive Southwest. It's hard to say if all these parts are from the same incident, but some are probably from this. Yeah, Atlanta police say one of their patrol cars was stolen, crashed, then hit by a train. But what led up to this bizarre incident? Well, it all started at the end of a traffic stop in the early morning hours of Saturday, January 28, 2023. This is APD Zone 4 in southwest Atlanta. The officer was wrapping up that traffic stop when someone took off in his car. Police say the guy who jumped into the cruiser was not involved in the traffic stop. Fortunately, the Atlanta Police Air Unit quickly found the car. Here it is, blue lights flashing, flying eastbound down Langford Parkway. Police say the ground units were following the stolen car at a safe distance. And not long after the chase began, the suspect lost control and the car overturned. But things were about to get worse. This was a hot rail. Yeah, a train was coming. The Atlanta police officers, with some help from Georgia State Troopers, now had to get the guy out. Luckily, they were able to pull him to safety just before a southbound Norfolk Southern train collided with the police SUV. Police say the man was charged with theft by taking, fleeing and eluding, reckless driving, obstruction, and damage to city property. So a suspect was in custody, a police car was wrecked, but everyone was all right. There is no doubt, our police officers, firefighters, and EMS workers have to be ready to respond to emergencies on the railroad. Well, that's where this facility comes in. There's trouble on the tracks in Meridian, Mississippi. Two Amtrak coaches are lying in a ravine, and a locomotive has just struck a van. Meanwhile, a badly damaged tanker truck sits near the train. It looks like a disaster zone, but fortunately, this is all staged. And while the emergency isn't real, the training first responders receive here is. 
These are not mock-ups. The locomotive and passenger coaches once traveled the country on America's rail network. They now reside here at the Meridian Public Safety Training Facility. According to the facility's website, in 1999, it acquired this Amtrak locomotive, the lounge car behind it, two sleeper cars, and around 300 yards of track. First responders will have to be prepared to extricate people from side windows or the ends of the cars. The ravine here also simulates the challenging terrain rescuers may face. Of course, they can't simulate every scenario here in Meridian, but they've got a lot covered. And that includes something that happens far too often in the United States, a grade crossing accident. According to FRA statistics posted on Operation Lifesaver's website, there were more than 2,000 highway rail grade crossing collisions in 2022. Railroads are still alive and well here in the Magnolia State. Meridian hosts Amtrak's Crescent. It stops at the city's rebuilt Union Station. Norfolk Southern and CPKC trains also pass through here. As you can probably tell, freight is what you'll see the most of in Meridian. Now, companies like Norfolk Southern also train first responders for emergencies. This is the railroad's Operation Awareness and Response Train. The consist has special box cars where first responders can take classes. They can also get on top of and even go inside one of the tank cars, in addition to getting their hands on various fittings and valves. By now, you probably know that some trains haul hazardous materials. Back in Mississippi, what appear to be stand-ins for tank cars sit next to the train. If you're like me, you're probably wondering about the history of the old Amtrak equipment at the training facility. Well, after a little internet research, here's what I found out. Amtrak 305 is an electromotive division F40PH, which was built in 1979. And I believe the lounge car behind it is ex-Pennsylvania Railroad. Meanwhile, this sleeper, the Pacific Beach, is ex-Union Pacific. With all the vegetation around the other car, I wasn't able to get any information about it. All of these were built in the late 1940s and early 50s and were part of Amtrak's heritage fleet. Basically, cars that Amtrak acquired from other railroads when it took over passenger services in the U.S. Historic cars like these were eventually replaced by superliners, amfleets, and viewliners. While the train accident scene definitely caught my eye, this is not the only part of this facility. There are 99 acres here, and on the property, they have a three-story burn tower, a staged structural collapse and rubble pile, a kennel for canines, a driving track, and firing ranges. These so-called Katrina cottages provide lodging for visiting first responders. You know, getting hands-on with rail equipment like this would certainly be memorable, but hopefully responding to a real passenger train derailment is something the students here will never have to do. I would hope the firefighters who responded to this derailment and blaze had the training they needed to knock down the flames and Get this situation under control. Tank cars on the ground and the aftermath of a fire. This was the scene at CSX's Hal's Yard in Atlanta, Georgia on November 17th, 2023. Now, what's a little unusual about this incident is that two railroads were involved. According to a CSX press release, around 6.28 a.m., a Norfolk Southern train came into contact with a CSX train at an interchange point here in the yard, resulting in a derailment. A locomotive also caught on fire after this happened. You can see all around the lead locomotive, it looks like it just snowed. Well, that white substance on the ground is what was used to contain the blaze. Fortunately, no one was hurt and there was no risk to the public. CSX said an unknown amount of diesel fuel spilled, along with some plastic pellets. A Norfolk Southern spokesman told me they're working with CSX to investigate what happened. I got here around 9.45 a.m. and crews were starting to clean all this up. I spotted mostly tank cars off the rails, along with a covered hopper. A gondola back here may have also been on the ground. In this shot, you can see what looks like a vacuum truck helping with the cleanup efforts. Not long after I arrived, the cavalry rolled in. Yeah, I'm talking about R.J. Corman, the derailment cleanup experts with their side boom tractors. Of course, this was a big story in Atlanta and a news helicopter was briefly overhead. 
Meanwhile, down here, yard operations continued. This happened at the north end of the yard, far from the main line. So why exactly would a Norfolk Southern train be here on CSX property at Howell's Yard? Well, it's actually very common. NS interchanges with CSX here. They'll bring a cut of rail cars from their system up here and take back whatever CSX has waiting for them. The two railroads intersect and are also connected here at How Y. At the scene, you can see two CSX locomotives, 1702 and 1704. Both are rebuilt EMDs, now designated as SD40E3s. It appears 1702 lost its handrails on the right side of the engine. These units can be remotely operated with one operator outside of the cab using a belt pack similar to this. Okay, we don't have an official cause of all this yet, but I'll be looking out for one. The derailment we're looking at next shows that Mother Nature is one of the few things that can actually stop a train. Lots of twisted metal and mud. That's probably the best way to describe this Norfolk Southern derailment scene in Jasper, Alabama. This happened on the night of April 8th, 2023, and I recorded this footage a week later on April 15th. According to the Jasper Police Department, the train crew was briefly trapped in the engine room after the locomotive tilted over. Units like these don't really have engine rooms, but it's probably safe to say the railroad employees were trapped here in the cab. There's no question, this locomotive took a beating. The right side of it is caked in mud, the handrails are bent, and it looks like one of its windshields is missing. But the left side fared a little better. And by the way, even though this is a Norfolk Southern right-of-way, it's not uncommon to see locomotives from a variety of companies operating on rail lines around the U.S. and Canada. So-called foreign power or run-through power is often put on a train on its home rails and used up until and even after it reaches its destination in another railroad's territory. While crews may be swapped, locomotives aren't changed out just because, for example, the train goes from Union Pacific to Norfolk Southern Rails. Despite the damage to this Union Pacific GE AC44 CW CTE, the Jasper Police Department said there were no major injuries. Let's just hope everyone is doing okay now. Furthermore, the police said the Jasper Fire Department called all personnel in to manage the scene and help get the railroaders out of the engine. According to the Jasper PD, Norfolk Southern personnel said no hazardous materials were involved or released into the area. In this wet and muddy field, there were hoppers, covered hoppers, boxcars, and tank cars. But it appears this covered hopper on the right in the shade isn't covered anymore. In total, I counted 11 rail cars on the ground here. Their wheels and trucks had been gathered up and put in a pile. Now, this part of Alabama saw a lot of rainfall the weekend this happened, and washouts do occur from time to time on railroads. Okay, let me give you an idea of where we are. Jasper, Alabama is about 40 miles northwest of Birmingham. The line in Jasper goes from Birmingham, Alabama to Memphis, Tennessee, and is part of Norfolk Southern's Gulf Division. Something interesting about Jasper is that the NS line is actually crossed by Burlington Northern Santa Fe here at this diamond. This is the farthest west I've ever come to cover a derailment, and I was not expecting to see BNSF Jeeps or an old Burlington Northern crane out here. At the time I'm recording this special, this next derailment is still part of an ongoing NTSB investigation. Amtrak 19, the southbound Crescent, is approaching its next station stop in Anniston, Alabama. Under its wheels, new rails and fresh ballast. But off to the side of the right-of-way, wreckage from a recent Norfolk Southern derailment. These cars came off the tracks here in Iron City on Thursday, March 9th, 2023. And the photos are courtesy of the Calhoun County Sheriff's Office. According to the NTSB, which is now investigating, NS Train 245A109 derailed two locomotives and 37 rail cars. This included three empty tank cars with residue of hazardous materials, but they did not release anything, according to the NTSB. 
I should mention the train actually derailed in two places and the scene you see here was closest to the head end of the train. Fortunately, no injuries were reported. Norfolk Southern estimated damages to signal infrastructure, equipment, and track to be around $2.9 million. Now, the train in question here had six locomotives and 108 rail cars. And I found two of those locomotives near the Anniston Amtrak station. These were not under power at the time of the derailment and were being transported as waybill locomotives. That basically means Norfolk Southern was being paid to move them somewhere, but I don't know what the final destination was for these two engines. The NTSB said these were picked up in Bluffton, Indiana on February 24th, 2023. Both of these are old, rebuilt General Purpose or GP locomotives manufactured by General Motors Electromotive Division in the mid-1950s. They worked for Illinois Central for many years and still wear that railroad's paint scheme. The IC's so-called Death Star logo is on the nose. Now, I did my best to try to find the owner behind the RMEX reporting marks, but was unsuccessful. At first glance, these things seem to be in decent condition, but the NTSB's preliminary report pointed out a significant issue. According to the NTSB, quote, the Waybell locomotives were not equipped with alignment control couplers, which resist lateral coupler movement under compressive in-train forces. NS Operating Rule L212 prohibits coupling together locomotives without alignment control couplers when those locomotives will be dead in tow. Okay, so dead in tow means the locomotive or locomotives will not be under power and used to pull the train. And lateral coupler movement means movement from side to side. All right, here's exactly what NS Operating Rule L212 says. A. When the consist includes more than one locomotive that does not have alignment control draft gear, extreme caution must be exercised when applying locomotive or dynamic brake or handling the throttle and backup or shoving movements to prevent locomotives from jackknifing. B. Locomotives not equipped with alignment control draft gear when moving dead in tow in a locomotive consist or train must not be coupled to another locomotive that does not have alignment control draft gear. Exception. This restriction does not apply to a light locomotive movement. This can all be found in NS1, Rules for Equipment Operation and Handling, effective January 1st, 2019. The NTSB also found, quote, an NS inspection performed before the first movement involving the coupled waybill locomotives did not identify the absence of alignment control couplers. Furthermore, the NTSB noted that, quote, the waybill locomotives were moved by four trains before being added to train 245A109 on the day of the derailment. I tried my best to capture a few close-up photos of the couplers on these units with my drone, but I honestly couldn't spot the difference between these and what you'd see on a more modern locomotive. I didn't get any footage of crews cleaning up the last derailment, but here's a look at some of the equipment used to get things back on track. It's September 24th, 2023, and there's been some kind of incident at Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in Atlanta, Georgia. And a crew with RJ Corman is on its way to the scene. If you didn't know, they specialize in cleaning up train derailments. And to do this, they need special equipment. They use these side boom tractors that were originally designed for pipe laying. The tractors themselves travel on one trailer while their booms ride on another. Whatever happened here today at Inman seemed to be pretty minor. Keep in mind that not every derailment is a major incident. That being said, I still want to show you what an RJ Corman crew is capable of doing in a relatively short amount of time. Here's a derailment from 2022 that also happened at Inman Yard. This time lapse shows around two hours of work. That's pretty impressive. Of course, not all incidents require those side boom tractors. Some businesses have pressed highway wreckers into service to help with rail car repairs or to get train wheels back on the track. The sweet sounds of an Electromotive SD40-2. The SD stands for Special Duty and today, this engine is assisting in a somewhat unconventional task. Nearly half a mile away from the head end of this train, you can see a crew repairing a covered hopper with a heavy wrecker and small excavator. When I got the drone over this, it appeared that Wrecker was doing the lifting while the excavator stabilized the car. This piece of rolling stock weighs nearly 56,000 pounds when it's not loaded. The machines would soon be used to pull one of the trucks from under this covered hopper. These workers were called after an incident in Pendleton, South Carolina. 
Now, Pendleton is in the northwestern part of the state, not far from the border with Georgia. The incident happened on Thursday, June 22, 2023, and I was here the following morning. This is Norfolk Southern Territory. Several miles north, the tracks here branch off of the main line that goes to Greenville, South Carolina. One of the major railroad customers in Pendleton is a Michelin tire plant. You can see it in the distance. The rails that split off to the right lead to the plant. The covered hopper here usually carries carbon black, which is used in the tire manufacturing process, and it's really messy stuff. Most of what I saw was work being done on the car's truck and wheels. A center pin aligns the truck to the car. The men would eventually get everything secured under here so the car could move again. Pulling ahead about half a car. Easy or what? No, just a regular half car between. No, we got everything rehooked and everything's back on the road. After all that, it looked and sounded like whatever they did worked. The covered hopper was rolling. It was now time for the heavy equipment to move out. This is definitely the first time I've seen a tow truck used to repair a rail car, but that doesn't mean it's not uncommon. In fact, I believe the company that operates this truck actually specializes in railroad repairs. I would imagine a wrecker like this would be able to navigate the back roads around here better than a big crane. Back at the front of the train, this old school crossing belt had been ringing for a long time. Meanwhile, these engines were actually brought up from Gainesville, Georgia to help out. That's more than 70 miles away. But now, it was time for the conductor to uncouple them from the train. Another crew would take it from here. These guys were headed home. I wasn't able to find any further details about the incident I just showed you. It may not have met the monetary damage threshold required to file a report with the FRA. Of course, you saw that railroads haul messy stuff like carbon black for tire manufacturing, but you may not know that they also transport our nation's military equipment. Unfortunately, this move did not go according to plan. As a taxpayer, this is probably not something you want to see. Rail cars hauling pricey military equipment off the rails and on the ground. This happened in Colorado Springs, Colorado on October 9th, 2023, not far from Fort Carson. These photos are courtesy of the Stratmore Hills Fire District. According to 4th Infantry Division Public Affairs Officer Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Payton, the train was headed back to Fort Carson from Fort Irwin in California. Fort Irwin is home to the National Training Center. It's unclear to me who owns the tracks here, but Colonel Payton said both Union Pacific and BNSF both responded to the scene after the derailment. He also said no soldiers or civilians were injured, and there were no weapons or hazardous materials on the train. Yes, now, it's pretty common to see military equipment transported by rail. I caught this train passing through Tucker, Georgia in September of 2023. This was hauling all kinds of vehicles, including what looked like armored military backhoes. Meanwhile, this train was hauling Bradley fighting vehicles. I saw it in Decatur, Georgia in January of 2023. Rail fan or not, trains like these get everyone's attention and they may also raise some questions like, where do they go or how are all those vehicles loaded? Well, trains like these may be headed to training exercises somewhere in the U.S. They could also be in transit from the factory to a military base. Other vehicles transported by rail could eventually be taken off the train and shipped overseas. And some trains carry supplies and munitions. Ultimately, railroads would be critical in mobilizing the country for war. They've been used by militaries around the world for well over 100 years. Some large military installations have railheads where equipment can be loaded and unloaded. And yeah, the U.S. Army and other branches of the military have their own locomotives. Ramps are typically used to load wheeled and tracked vehicles. 
Wheeled vehicles can roll from car to car using special bridges. Tracked vehicles don't need these. Cranes may also be used to load equipment, along with large forklifts. Everything is then secured to the rail cars. This is kind of like the military's version of Amtrak's auto train, although they've been doing it a lot longer than Amtrak. Operations like this don't just happen stateside. Members of the U.S. Armed Forces also move their vehicles and supplies by rail in other countries. This video shows soldiers unloading empty rocket pods in Poland. And this footage was shot at U.S. Army Garrison Humphreys in South Korea. Notice how, even though the rail cars are being used overseas, they still have U.S. markings. Back in Colorado Springs, it looks like whoever loaded these cars did a pretty good job. The trucks in the photos still appear to be chained down. I haven't seen a cause listed for that derailment just yet, but I'll keep you posted. Okay, so sometimes railroads have to haul their own equipment back to the shop to be serviced or repaired after an accident. Let's take a look at one example of how they do that. The sun is beginning to set in Doraville, Georgia, which is just north of the city of Atlanta. This light is perfect for recording MARTA trains, but in the Norfolk Southern Yard below, the locomotives here are not so photogenic anymore. They're chained to huge flat cars with wooden cribbing under them where their trucks would usually be. Now, to understand what happened to these units, we have to go back to the end of 2022 in Collegedale, Tennessee. The cause of this derailment was clear. The train with three locomotives up front rammed a tractor trailer hauling a huge 137-foot concrete bridge beam. It all happened on Tuesday, December 20th, 2022. This video, taken by a nearby driver, was widely circulated online. In my opinion, the footage is so dramatic, it likely caused this story and video to be picked up by national and even international news outlets. The Chattanooga Fire Department shared these pictures on its Facebook page. At the time they posted the images, they said personnel at the scene were working on stopping a diesel and lube oil leak, but no other hazardous materials were involved. Norfolk Southern would later report to the Federal Railroad Administration that approximately 2,000 gallons of diesel fuel spilled into the creek here. According to a January 11, 2023 press release issued by the Collegedale Police Department, the train crew was transported to the hospital with injuries. Hopefully, they're doing better now. These three engines sat in Tennessee for months before they ended up here in Georgia. I first spotted them at Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in northwest Atlanta. The engines were there with some other high and wide loads. Their trucks were sitting on separate flat cars. I then found these locomotives again four days later here in Doraville. Oh, and if you're wondering why those buildings look a little out of place back there, well, that's because they're part of a movie studio that's being built. Okay, according to ns-9.com, the damaged engines sitting in the yard down here are headed to Altoona, Pennsylvania. That town is home to Norfolk Southern's Juniata Locomotive Shop. Here, locomotives are rebuilt, repaired, and overhauled. In fact, number 4067, which took a major beating, was one of many DC to AC conversions rebuilt at Juniata. Among other things, the unit got a new wide nose cab and AC traction motors. This facility was built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in the late 1800s. It then became a part of Penn Central and later Conrail before being taken over by Norfolk Southern. Big Blue, another name for Conrail, isn't all that colorful in these black and white images that were part of a historic American engineering record and are available on the Library of Congress's website. There's no telling when these three units will be back on the rails again. I don't know how badly they were damaged. But if anyone can get them going again, the folks in Altoona are probably up for the challenge. Believe it or not, there are times when you'd actually want to intentionally derail a locomotive or train car. Okay, so I can't tell you exactly how this car ended up on its side, but I have a feeling it's because this device did its job. This thing is simply called a derail, and I don't think that needs much explanation. Essentially, it stops cars from this industry track from fouling the main line. This one is pretty substantial. It's called a split rail and works like a turnout or switch. 
Meanwhile, this yellow piece of metal is a wedge-style derail. It can derail engines or cars going in either direction. And one of the smallest examples of one of these devices is this portable derail. Derails can be powered and remotely controlled, but most are unlocked manually with a key. I think we can all agree, we have far too many grade crossing accidents in the United States. This one not only caused major damage to the tractor trailer, it also caused a derailment and injured people on board the train. Amtrak's sleek Pacific Surfliner was on its way to LA when it hit a truck near Somos, California on December 12, 2023. Surfliner trains operate in push-pull mode, meaning there's a driver's cab in the locomotive and one at the other end of the train in this cab car. As you can see, the cab car derailed. Looking at this video shot by the California Highway Patrol, it looks like the truck's trailer took out a signal as it was pushed by the train. One more clip from the CHP shows the cab car back on the rails and rolling again. Not every grade crossing accident involves a car or truck. This is what's left of a side-by-side -side after it was hit by a BNSF train near Minden, Missouri on September 11, 2023. The Missouri State Highway Patrol said the small vehicle was stuck on the tracks. They also said no one was injured. Amazingly, no one was injured in this train versus truck accident in Tucker, Georgia. It happened sometime in the evening hours on Friday, July 14, 2023. The truck wasn't actually on a railroad crossing when it was hit, but actually behind a bar and stuck on the tracks. The train, running on CSX's Abbeville subdivision, pushed the truck across this bridge before coming to a stop. After looking for any damage and talking to local authorities, the train crew would eventually continue their journey north. I saw a tow truck recovering the pickup's toolbox on the road below. Looking at the damage here, there is no doubt, the train always wins. As I said earlier, Mother Nature is one of the few things that can actually stop a train. That was the case here in Northeast Somerset, Maine on April 15th, 2023. According to accident data as reported by railroads on the FRA's website, this Canadian Pacific train encountered a washed out part of the line and derailed. Three locomotives came off the tracks along with six cars. The Greenville Firefighters Association took these pictures which show the train actually caught on fire after derailing. They say some of the train's cars were hauling hazardous materials, but they stayed upright and didn't burn. The final incident we're going to look at happened on one of America's busiest transit systems and involved a specialized piece of snow clearing equipment. This train on this day was designed to stop within 1,780 feet. It didn't. So now we needed to determine why. There's not much left of the operator's cab on this Chicago Transit Authority train after it collided with a piece of snow clearing equipment on the morning of November 16th, 2023. Thanks to footage shot by the National Transportation Safety Board, we're getting a closer look at this accident scene and a better idea of what happened here. The train was loaded with passengers on CTA's yellow line when it struck this piece of equipment near Howard Station. More than 20 people were injured, according to the NTSB. This view, courtesy of Google Earth, shows us where the collision occurred. This is the north side of Chicago in the Rogers Park neighborhood. CTA's Howard Yard is adjacent to the tracks here. One thing to note about the area where this happened is that there's a curve here and the train operator's view may have been limited. Following the accident, the NTSB sent a team of 14 people to investigate. According to the NTSB, the piece of equipment that was hit, called a snow fighter, was out on the rails training employees, and six people were on board. Now, we know that CTA's system saw the snow equipment ahead. It was supposed to be there. They knew it was going to be there. This machine is diesel-powered and doesn't rely on the electrified third rail. NTSB Chair Jennifer Homedy said a preliminary review of the train event recorder data indicated the train hit the snow fighter at 26.9 miles per hour. The transit cars involved are part of the 5000 series, which were built by Bombardier Transportation from 2009 through 2015, and they operate as married pairs. Now, the CTA has a system in place that's supposed to space trains out so they don't collide. This is absolutely critical on a high-volume transit system where many trains share the same track. 
A following train should slow down and stop if it gets too close to another, but the parameters on Chicago's system may need to be examined, according to the NTSB chair. The braking distance should have been longer. A brand new system today with the same track, they should have had 2,745 feet to stop that train, not 1,780 feet. That is a design problem. And why is it different today? Over time, cars get heavier. There are more passengers. We'll have to look at some changes that have been made to the system. That's essentially an old design. Hamadi also said investigators so far have found nothing wrong with the signaling system and that the operator did slow the train, but something on the rails made that difficult. We know there was some residue. It was thick and black. Uh, part of the track. We also know that the wheels were slipping when the operator was braking. This time of year, leaves can often cause trains to lose traction and interfere with braking. Okay, so just keep in mind, much of the information released by the NTSB so far is preliminary as they're still in the early stages of their investigation. Despite the accident, Hamidi says people should still feel comfortable riding Chicago's L. I would take the train tonight, tomorrow. I have no concerns, safety concerns about taking the train. We've now reached the end of this special. Look, I understand that minor derailments are just a part of doing business in the railroad industry. Accidents happen from time to time, but the major incidents we've seen in 2023 should not be considered routine. Something needs to change in the U.S. Do we need upgraded infrastructure, more government oversight of the corporations that operate their mega-sized trains through our towns. Perhaps companies need to hire more people to run those trains so no one feels overworked. And should there be a limit on just how long a train can be? It's not up to me to decide, but I think those questions are worth asking the CEOs in charge and our elected leaders. I know I wasn't able to cover every notable train derailment and accident from 2023, but I still hope you learned something after watching this. If you did, please share it with people who you know who might benefit from the information. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.